going. And uh, everybody, I think everybody's seeing my screen, so I'm going to just um, minimize the control thing there. I'm just going to wait one more second to make sure there's not some last second crisis, can't see your screen or hear you thing from you guys. And test, you're correct. That is Bargov. We're going to edit this part of the recording out, by the way. <clears throat> Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to continue my series of talks that are fairly basic radiography and uh, start moving down the body towards the pelvis and hip this morning. Um, it's an area that is uh, important because we see a lot of trauma involving the pelvis and hip, and uh, I'll kind of focus on basic things like trauma. But in the last, say, 10 years or so, we've had a we're kind of a renewed interest in in the basic radiography of the hip joint as it relates to femoral acetabular impingement. And we're doing a lot of advanced studies for that, like MR and MR arthrography, which I won't focus on today, but this talk is uh, kind of a setup for Dr. Biswal, who's going to talk about hip MRI in a few weeks. So what I'll do is is what I've been doing recently is go through a set of basic slides showing some of the anatomy and relevant uh, details to look at, and then we'll go through some cases. I'm mainly going to focus on the hip, but I'll just touch on pelvic radiography and some of the views that we do. And a lot of this I have intended for the junior residents who may not have spent any time in the uh, actual x-ray room or even the senior residents for that matter, so you have an idea what, what positions patients are in when we do these views. Fairly straightforward. So here's some diagrams that I've taken from the Greenspan textbook, where um, you know it's obvious. It just shows the beam and the body position and what the view is that one obtains. One thing to keep in mind for the uh, the pelvis, the AP pelvis view, is something that we also do when we do hip aspirations or injections. Is that you want to have the feet so that they're either pointing up or a little bit internally rotated. And the effect of that is that it takes the femoral necks and rotates them and sort of rotates the trochanter such that you get a nice AP view of the hips. If you if you don't do that, the tendency is for a patient to kind of naturally externally rotate the hips and get a, a less AP view of the trochanter. So that's a simple AP pelvis view. And a lot of times in the in the reading room, you may see this type of view where you think, oh, they cut off the iliac crests here. And that's actually not um, a, a technical problem. It's an intentional thing that's done, depending on the orthopedic surgeon and referring doc. Um, this so-called low AP pelvis view, clipping the crests, is done basically to center up on the hips themselves so you get less parallax and distortion of the area of interest. And so um, technically, that's called a low AP pelvis. An AP pelvis should include the iliac crests uh, uh, in, in their entirety. Uh, in trauma, we do some oblique views uh, called Jude views, and th this is a, a focused in example of what would be a, a right hip on an anterior oblique view. And basically, the patient is tilted up about 45 degrees, so you're shooting down the hip articulation here, and you get an oblique view of the hip and pelvic structures, which I'll look at uh, in a moment uh, in more detail. So the opposite view would be to tilt the patient the other way and get like the right side of the patient down and looking at the hip in an opposite projection. So you can get the straight AP or you can get these oblique views, um, often called Jude views, J-U-D-E-T. <clears throat> the, the main value of those in trauma especially is to look at the acetabular columns. And I'm not going to focus on acetabular trauma today, but just to remind everybody that the, have to remember that the the innominate bones that make up the the hemi pelvis, if you will, are made up of the the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And in adults, those are all fused. Um, but these columns are are defined according to continuity between the the ilium and the pubis for the anterior column. That's obviously anterior. And then between the ilium and the ischium for the posterior column here. 
So the surgeons pay a lot of attention to this for fractures because if uh, something disrupts either this anterior column or the posterior column, or seen in this view here, anterior or posterior, it, it affects the stability of the, of the pelvis and they need to consider uh, stabilizing that. <clears throat> These, uh, these are virtual Judae views. These are created from the volume rendering from our CT data, so they're not quite as sharp, but they basically will show the uh, like right posterior oblique. And so on the right side of this patient, see the ilium going down towards the ischium. So that's going to be the posterior column. And on the same view that is full field, on the left side of the patient, you see the anterior column here. Okay, And so then the opposite on the other side, and the, um, the surgeons like to get these both with the plain radiographs. You'll see these five view pelvis things come through in, in both initial diagnosis and for follow-up. And I'd say the main benefit of these is not so much necessarily to, to detect and, and diagnose the fractures as it is to assess the fracture alignment and the overall alignment of the pelvis, the pelvic bones is something shifted up, down, to the right, left, in, out, so to be able to follow for overall pelvic stability over time. <clears throat> and the same thing is true for these inlet, outlet views. So this is the so-called outlet view or Ferguson view where you're shooting obliquely, kind of imagine something coming out, outward of the pelvis here or basically thinking of the under aspect of the pubic symphysis here, kind of the pelvic outlet. And here you get kind of a nice AP view of the pubic bones and symphysis. And you can tell, is this cephalad or caudal uh, displaced? Uh, these, these images are from this Greenspan book, which we have in the bone room. And it's a good book for looking at these types of, uh, of diagrams for understanding how different views are taken. So here's inlet and outlet views. And you can imagine just here's the inlet view here you can imagine, you know, the the pelvic brim where, uh, you know, fetus presumably would, uh, you know, be going into the pelvis that way or something coming out of the pelvis this way. That's kind of the way I remember it. When we get to the hip, the uh, anatomy is uh, important to, to realize because we think of it as a ball and socket. But the important thing about the hip socket itself is that it's not a complete hemisphere of of bone or articular cartilage. <clears throat> so here you can see this, this peripheral zone of the acetabulum here. And then centrally you have this, this little rim here that leads to this deeper part. And so there is, there is continuity of bone sort of open inferiorly here. But this is acetabular fossa here. And this is filled with fat <clears throat> normally and it's where the ligamentum teres comes in. And it's really only in this peripheral part where you have articular cartilage, and it, it does go most of the way around the hip. So the key thing is not to be looking for cartilage in the acetabulum centrally. And also when we look at MRs of the hip, we need to take that into account for the, the, uh, the, the fovea and so forth more centrally. The, uh, the columns, as I said, I'm not going to go into more detail here, but if you were looking at this one, you'd say here's, here's going to be the ilium here coming down anteriorly across the acetabulum to the pubis. That would be the anterior column, and then the posterior column would come down along through here, ilium towards the ischium down here. Um, it's, it's important to distinguish the acetabular columns from the walls. So the columns are these big bony structures that kind of have continuity and big structural stability for the whole pelvis. The walls of the acetabulum could just be these projections here that sort of deepen the socket. So you could imagine fracturing off this part of the acetabulum and just having it just be a posterior wall fracture. So don't kind of confuse wall with, with column. Okay, so posterior wall, anterior wall right in here. And then we also sometimes distinguish just the very rim of the acetabulum as just the edge of it along here. <clears throat> the femur anatomy is pretty straightforward. You have the femoral head and neck and greater and lesser trochanters here in the intertrochanteric region. Um, a lot of times on the radiographs, you can also see some little lucencies in the low femoral neck. These are vascular channels that are coming into the, um, into the femur here. And um, so that's pretty straightforward anatomy. When we look at the uh, radiographs of the hip, 
<clears throat> again, what sort of stimulated us to be more detailed about this is understanding more about femoral acetabular impingement in the last, say, decade or so. And it's also good to realize in trauma. So here's our cartoon diagram, right? So here's femur. And so this, this line here, E, that's the anterior wall of the acetabulum or the anterior rim, if you will. F is going to be the posterior wall here, posterior rim, synonymous, okay? And that's the normal situation is because posterior projects further out because the acetabulum is kind of antiverted, okay? So if you look at a radiograph of the hip, you should be able to, or you should at least look to see if you can see this line here, which is the anterior wall, and this line here, which is the posterior wall. And I'll show more examples in impingement in a minute. But it becomes important to just recognize that you can, in fact, often see those lines and you want to kind of scrutinize those, especially in the setting of trauma, to see if there's little cracks or possible subtle things that you can see that could be injured. So that's a state, straight AP view of the hip. And then if we want to get oblique or, or orthogonal views, one way of doing it is the frog leg view, which is named for obvious reasons here. And in this case, the patient's overall pelvis doesn't have to change much. You can do bilateral view like this, um, do that sometimes in kids. More often in adults, we do a unilateral view, showing some tilt and rotating the hip out, but not really rotating the pelvis out much. We can have a, a better view of that here. So here's a, here's a patient. She's rotated up a little bit here. Um, the, the hip is is rotated out externally, and so you're going to get almost a 90 degree view of this right hip compared to a straight AP. Now, obviously, you can't do this view if somebody's in severe pain or if there's acute trauma and a possible fracture because you could displace it. <clears throat> so, there's another way of getting a, a lateral view of the hip called the true lateral, which we see a lot more of in in impingement workups and in the acute trauma setting. And this one can be a little bit harder to interpret. Um, but projection-wise, it's pretty easy to understand. And the idea here is that, you know, if I go back for a second to the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, uh, the, the frog leg lateral view, um, the pelvis didn't have to move very much for this one. Um, <clears throat> this leg had to move a fair amount. So the, the kind of affected leg had to move somewhat to get that view. Excuse me. But the, for the true lateral view, it would be the left side of this uh, patient here, that doesn't have to move at all. What you have to do is you have to move the opposite leg out of the way and flex that up. And then you can put a plate over here and shoot through the hip and basically get this view where you're seeing anterior, posterior, inferior, and superior. Um, and it's a little bit obliqued from inferior to superior, but you get a nice view of the femoral head and neck junction and the alignment of the femoral neck with the trochanters and so on. Um, but you haven't had to move this affected hip. So that's usually what we end up with in trauma. The tricky thing is with this is that there's a lot of tissue to, to expose across, and the exposure can be variable, depends on the patient size and so on. Um, I would say right now we're doing a really good job of getting these routinely um, on our patients, and part of it's been helped by better digital radiography capabilities. So that's the true lateral view of the hip, or, or often called the cross-table lateral view. Now, go, moving into a little bit of pathology here, and um, again, we'll hear more about this later, but, but the uh, concepts come up over the past uh, you know, 10, 15 years of, about people having actual bony impingement in the hip. And simple concept is if you look at like an axial representation of the femur and the acetabulum here, that in the normal situation, we can rotate the femur around pretty freely through this, this circular articulation without any contact here. <clears throat> In the so-called pincer type impingement, imagine like this acetabulum being like too large and like a, a crab pincher or something like surrounding more of the femur than, than would be normal. And you can imagine that if that's the case, then you can have areas of potential contact there. So that's like so-called a pincher, pincer type of impingement which is different than the, the cam type impingement where the socket in cam is about the, the normal shape, but you have some asphericity of the femoral head or some pro bony prominence that, that that femoral component can actually end up leading to some 
impingement on the acetabulum. So a um, couple different ideas about <clears throat> impingement. Um, often you have mixed types of things. And I would just say that overall, in terms of what, what is our role in radiology, it's, it's probably more important when it comes to the advanced imaging, like MR, MR arthrography, and looking at the details of, of the, the joint. On radiography, we want to look for these signs that indicate the potential risk factors for FAI. But uh, I think we have to be pretty careful about committing to that diagnosis when we just view the radiographs. You certainly cannot diagnose FAI just on radiographs. You can see signs that may correlate with that clinical syndrome. And I know in my own reports uh, on hips and pelvis, I will rarely even use the term FAI. I'll just describe the specific findings that we see and let the uh, orthopedic surgeon decide if they think it fits into the spectrum of FAI. So we'll see a couple. We'll see some more details on that, and as time goes on here. So again, for the normal hip, and th this is um, <clears throat> the images from that article that I sent out by email, and um, it's really probably one of the best articles that there is about hip anatomy. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the high points of it. If you if you look at this diagram with all the letters here, it it looks sort of daunting and. Uh, too much detail, so we won't focus in on on every last detail. But um, just to remind you, look at things like this dotted line here. That's going to be the anterior wall, and it can be subtle here. So it's like this little subtle line right in here, and the posterior wall coming down like this. The E has to do with uh, acetabular coverage, and you know, looking at whether there's sufficient coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. Uh, this, these arrows in this diagram show that for most normal patients, the, the physeal scar, the sclerotic line here, should stay within the circle of the femoral head. When we look at femoral heads that are less spherical than this, this line, physeal scar, can extend outside of that, and that may be a sign of, of CAM-type morphology, for example. I wouldn't worry too much about that. For this one, I'd worry about the acetabular uh, walls here and here. And then also this concept here where you see this F, that's the floor of the acetabular fossa. Remember when I showed that, that bony photograph, you have the part that's got the cartilage on it, and then you have this deeper part in the socket here, the acetabular fossa. And so if that fossa comes up to this line, this ilioischial line, right, ilium down to ischium, there's that line. In the normal case, it stays lateral to that. If that comes up to the ilioischial line, that so-called um, coxa profunda, like large hip, okay? And then if the femoral head actually goes past that line, that's actually what we call protrusio acetabuli, right? So I'm gonna show those examples here. So, so here's their um, tanisinol's example of coxa profunda. <clears throat> so here, the floor of that acetabular fossa here is going past the ilioischial line. And basically what this is trying to get at is, oh, that's kind of a deep socket because the, the, that floor of the fossa is going medial to the ilioischial line. They're showing that there's, there's less, uh, less uh, uh, over, you know, there's, there's more coverage of the femoral head in this case. And so this is kind of maybe heading towards the potential for that pincer type impingement. Another thing to notice on this example here is that you can see the posterior wall kind of crossing about halfway across the femoral head here, and that's what you expect for normal, okay? So that, that line there, the anterior wall is like in here in that case. So we'll look at a case in a second that's got more coverage over here called posterior over coverage, also getting into that kind of uh, pincer type risk factor. So in the in the um, previous example, you could see the, the, the floor of the acetabular fossa going medial to the ilioischial line. In this patient, actually the femoral head itself goes past that. So that's where you get a protrusio acetabuli and even a deeper socket. Um, another thing to look at, so we look, you want to look at the walls. And in particular, when you look at these walls, you want to look to see, um, do they cross over? And so on the cartoon here, you can see the posterior wall is this con con uh, complete line, anterior is the dotted line, 
And so normally the anterior wall should stay medial to the posterior wall. But if the anterior wall crosses out like this, then at this upper part of the acetabulum, there's actually retroversion. It's actually sort of facing more posterior than anterior. And so we're looking for this kind of figure of eight configuration that you have where the you have posterior wall, anterior wall comes up and crosses over. And so that can be a, a sign of bony over coverage kind of in the more localized sense, okay? So go ahead, yeah. So look at the, can, does this have to be in order to call this like a shot just at the hip or can you see that just have a greater graph to call it? Right, and that's, that's a really good point, Russ. And so uh, let me just, Sorry. no, no, it's good. I wanted, to, I should emphasize that because these these images in the that we're showing here and in this paper, they are they are focused in um, images of the hip. But it is critical. Actually, you you can't make these assessments on straight AP views of the hip. It has to be from a AP pelvis radiograph that's centered in the midline of the symphysis. So um, let's probably make that that um, statement further up front because. What happens is if you center up <clears throat> over the hip or if there are certain amounts of pelvic tilt, for example, you can, you can imagine these walls are in 3D and, and do different rotations and angles and things and parallax can make them look more prominent than uh, not. So these should be done on that kind of straight low AP pelvis view that I showed in a minute. And if we get to the cases, I'll, I'll uh, show that again. Here's that prominent posterior wall. So here, you know, normally I said it goes about halfway across. Here it's kind of going more than 50% across the whole femoral um, head here. <clears throat> and you can see it on the, the radiograph right there. Would you call that um, acetabular retroversion there at that point? Is that really happening? With the, the, the posterior, so in this case, this wouldn't be retroversion because it's this the posterior wall that's so prominent sticking out. Here's the anterior wall here, so that's not crossing over, so it's still antiverted. It's just like the, the posterior aspect of the hip is too deep. That's It's like almost more antiverted than, than normal as opposed to retroverted. Here's the is issue about the physeal scar, and it's I don't, I don't pay that much attention to that because a lot of patients you can't see the scar, but what you can notice in a patient like this is that instead of having like a nice ball and a femoral neck that's well defined, like on this this inferior aspect, head and the neck here. Um, it's it's prominent here, and there's like not that concavity that comes up. So this is a, a bump, sometimes called um, a bony prominence at the head neck junction that's that's associated with this cam type of impingement pattern. So there's different angles and things that people look at, and won't get into that today, but but. Here's the idea where the scar goes outside the femoral neck. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of us probably have this type of bony morphology and never have any hip symptoms at all. So it's very much uh, a clinical diagnosis that you have to use to, to make this assessment of whether the imaging fits with the, the uh, clinical symptoms of impingement. Um, this just, the last couple of things here get to this business about head neck offset again. And so this is from one of those true lateral views of the hip where just for orientation again, so it's anterior, posterior, and then here's the femur down below, so that's inferior, superior. So this will be the anterior femoral neck, head neck junction, posterior, trochanters in here. And so a normal, we should have some offset between our head and the neck, right? And so they're talking about this, this, uh, <clears throat> this distance here, which they said offset about eight millimeters. You know, it's, it's, annoying to have to remember a bunch of numbers, so I, I don't really keep that number in mind. Um, this alpha here, this gets to the angle that's uh, discussed quite a bit in FAI, and um, basically the concept is that if you have a an angle that's defined by a point in the center of the femoral head and along the long axis of the femoral neck, then you basically take this other uh, arm of the triangle and you and you rotate it out until until the uh, the femoral head like leaves the circle so you have you have a circle along the whole articular surface of the femoral head and you move this out until bone starts to leave the circle so you're coming like you start the angle here and you go down here and be like oh oh bone just left the circle there at the femoral neck so that defines this angle 
And the higher that angle, the earlier the bone's leaving. So you can kind of see that that would be like bony prominence there, right? So we do that on MRI. Some people do it on lateral radiographs. It's not perfect on any of them because it's a 3D kind of concept. But <clears throat> so here's one where that alpha angle is increased, right? So here's the articular surface, center of the femoral head, femoral neck. There's that line coming out, you go cruising around here, it's like still in the circle, and then it's going out of the circle there, and there's that alpha angle, and normal is up to like 45 degrees or so, maybe it's 55, see, I can't remember the numbers, but um, the offset in this case is also going to be low, so you don't have quite that nice femoral head neck offset. <clears throat> so those are some basic concepts about um, impingement. Um, so let's take a look at some kind of real live cases here now. And um, let me just pause for one second to just, let me just open up this control panel. We'll cut this part out to make sure people are not like saying, hey, I couldn't hear you from the beginning. Okay, I think we're okay. Thank you all for checking in, by the way. Good to see you, John. Um, okay, we're going to trim that part out. So here's some cases. <clears throat> and so this. Um, this one, maybe that same one that I showed on the slide. This is uh, so. This is a low AP pelvis, and the the critical point that Dr. Stewart made, as he often does, um, is that to assess the hip, the hips, um, you really need to have an image that looks like this. So it's a low AP pelvis, and there's specific criteria about the the sacrum and coccyx should be in the midline here. And so it's hard to see in this patient, but here's like some of the sacral coccygeal segments. Um, it has to line up with the symphysis so you're not rotated. And the numbers vary between men and women, but it's sort of on the order of like three centimeters or so. The tip of the coccyx has to be above, above, above the symphysis to be the right pelvic rotation in an AP type direction, like, you know, pelvic tilt. So the techs are very tuned into that. The orthopedic surgeons are very tuned into that. And so you have to have the appropriate view to be able to assess the acetabular walls. <clears throat> then if you do have that, then you can look at each hip um, independently and try to assess for different morphologies. So in this example, um, <clears throat> it's, I'm considering this to be normal, okay? So here's the right hip, here's the anterior wall, here's the posterior wall here, it's about halfway out, right? On the left side, and you can barely see the anterior wall posterior wall. You can see that there's pretty good head neck offset, right? There's a concavity here, the head sort of centered on the femoral neck. Um, if you look at the acetabular fossa, it's, it's here. And so here's the articular part of the acetabulum. See that sclerotic rim? That's where the cartilage would be in the acetabulum. On the femur, the, the cartilage is almost all the way around the, the femoral head, except for centrally here in the fovea. So this one may not be perfectly normal because it's probably got a little bit of um, of protrusion of the of the um, let's see which is the best mouse to use here <clears throat> of the acetabular floor here beyond the ilioischial line. So this may be coxa profunda uh, of a mild degree. That's something we see all the time, and it seems to me that uh, a lot of women, in particular, it just seems to be the normal morphology that they have. So I wouldn't make too much of that. Okay, so that's fairly normal. <clears throat> um, pretty good normal on a cross table lateral here, right? So here's superior, inferior, um, anterior here. So he femoral head neck junction, nice offset, right? You have a nice spherical looking femoral head. Same thing on the other side here. And here is the um, AP radiograph from that patient. So does anybody see anything here that looks like it might be a morphological uh, issue? Things can be subtle, and I wouldn't um, kill myself trying to <clears throat> sort it out. If we just look at the right hip here, it's pretty close to normal, I would say. And a lot of these in the past, frankly, I would just dictate normal hip in like all these patients because they just because mainly what we're looking at for hips is like. The articular cartilage space, right? So here's acetabulum femur, nice thick space there. The medial part you can't really assess as well because of the acetabular fossa, but there's really no degenerative change here. Now, this patient 
here you really see the anterior wall real nicely here. Right? So that's the anterior wall, and here's the posterior wall coming down. Maybe it's a little bit um, posterior over coverage there. The main thing about this patient is they have they probably have they have a little more of that coxa profunda than the last patient. So here's the floor of the acetabulum, and it's coming medial to this line, that ilioischial line. So that's coxa profunda. So if I was dictating this case, I would just say uh, articular cartilage spaces are normal, uh, you know, the no fracture kind of malalignment kind of things, and then say um, coxa profunda, but not otherwise, you know, make any commentary on whether or not this patient could have FAI. So, you know, we have to be tuned into which um, surgeon is ordering uh, which exam as well. So to know what, what they're looking for and what to say, or if it's in the setting of trauma. Um, next example here. So we're kind of looking at these impingement possibilities. So what about this right? The, they're pretty symmetric on both sides. So let me just zoom in on the on the right hip here. Anybody see anything that looks like one of those uh, points that I made a couple minutes ago? So uh, not too dramatic. And so you say, well, can I see the walls? Eh, maybe. I mean, it's really tough. Even in normals, like maybe this is the anterior wall coming up along here. I don't really see it crossing over. Um, here's the floor of the acetabular fossa. Here's the ileocial line. So it could be a little bit of coxa profunda. The main thing here is this, this posterior wall is prominent. See how that's coming out laterally there, more than 50% of the femoral head? So that's like posterior wall prominence. Uh, could be considered over coverage, so kind of a subtle thing, but uh, worth worth kind of noting. All right. <clears throat> if you look at this guy, um, let me just show the. I gotta make sure I can show the. Uh, a, let me just go to the AP view here. All right. So different patient, <clears throat> male patient in this case, which is is only pertinent because. If you look at these impingement situations, that um, much more common for females to have the uh, pincer type of impingement, like the deep socket thing, and much more common for males to have the cam type of impingement. So, just looking at him from the the broad point of view, um, I think this is about a forty-five-year-old man, so not terribly old. Um, there's a prominence of the head neck junction, right? So it's not this nice spherical femoral head just on, centered up on the neck on either side. Like this side's probably got some early osteoarthritis because there's narrowing, there's osteophytes. This side's more normal um, in terms of degenerative change, but there's this bony prominence at the head neck junction. So that's, that's definitely one of the things you want to look for for um, potential for impingement, head neck junction prominence. <clears throat> In his case, I think there's some crossover. Um, if you look at the left hip here, trying to find those acetabular walls, and this, I would say, it's uh, it's fraught with potential error, and it's easy for your eye to get, uh, you know, distracted or or go along the wrong, the the wrong wall here. I would say in this patient, if I take this one, go for the lateral inferior wall that you can see, and, and, and you can usually assume that that's going to be posterior wall. So I can see that. I can follow it up to here, and then I'm having a little trouble following it there. Maybe it goes up to here. So that makes this line here the anterior wall. Okay, And so here coming up, and then maybe it comes up like this, and maybe it comes out like that. And so if, that, if I'm right about that, and if that's the anterior wall, then it's kind of crossing over the posterior wall, and that's a sign of acetabular retroversion. So a lot of times you don't really see that that confidently, or at least I don't. Like on the right side here, I'm thinking, well, could be the same thing. Posterior wall, anterior wall coming up here, and I think it goes out here, and it's kind of a figure of eight showing that superior acetabular retroversion. So I would tend to dictate on this case <clears throat> um, the, uh, you know, some of the features about narrowing of the cartilage space on the left and early osteophytes or small osteophytes consistent with early osteoarthritis or mild osteoarthritis. On the right side, maybe minimal cartilage space narrowing. 
But then if it's in the right setting uh, from the right referral, say slight bony prominence of the head neck junction and um, possible acetabular retroversion in the superior acetabulum, but not otherwise like, you know, commit the guy to a life of FAI. <clears throat> Um, the, the lateral views are relevant in this situation, too, and this is where typically uh, the, the main orthopedic surgeon who does the hip surgery here gets both laterals when he sees new patients to see if there's symmetry, whether they're symptomatic or not. And so in this one, um, you can see, again, superior, anterior. You can see the posterior head neck junction real nicely. So here's head coming into the neck, nice kind of concavity. But anteriorly, there's this big bony prominence there. So that's like a cam bump or a bony, bony bump associated with cam type impingement. One other thing to, to be conscious of that's relevant on these lateral views is you know, take advantage of this orthogonal view to try to look at the articular cartilage space. And it's it's not always easy to see, but here you can see the cartilage space posteriorly and then more anteriorly, and maybe there's a little bit narrowing anteriorly there. So you can, you can try to assess for arthritis uh, as well that way. <clears throat> um, let's see. So a couple more cases here. And um, this one I have in just to illustrate that, you know, not everything is uh, is, is sort of clean. You can have situations where, you know, you think, well, maybe there's some over coverage of the acetabulum, like the, you know, that's kind of a deep looking socket. Um, but also there's bony prominence of the head neck junction. And so this is a patient who, you know, is kind of labeled as having a combined type pincer and cam type uh, impingement. And, and it already has a moderate amount of degenerative change with cartilage space narrowing, osteophytes, and so on. And so another concept in this whole field of FAI is that, you know, once you get to be, you know, I'd say, you know, mid-40s or 50, uh, the idea that you're going to have some good outcome from having impingement surgery is uh, sort of out the window. I mean, once, you know, this is something that's dealt with in, in, in younger patients, um, and so once you start to get degenerative change and osteoarthritis, the, the advantage of having impingement surgery, which shaves off bone, reattaches the labrum, cleans it up, is smaller and smaller. So you're more crossing over into this total hip replacement kind of a, a situation if you have that uh, in, in later life like me. Hopefully just mid. But um, <clears throat> what about this patient? So here's a young um, younger um, female patient. And I've mentioned this before to people, I don't know if, you know, not, not everybody, but in terms of knowing gender easily on a, on a film, obviously there's like some soft tissue clues that you can often identify, but, um, you know, you, you never know. Um, but one, one, one handy trick here in um, male versus female that I, I like is that um, females tend to have a broader pelvic outlet here. So if you look at this inferior aspect of the pubic symphysis, it kind of goes up and it goes flat across and then down. That's the sort of female outlet type pattern. Um, and if I can go back to this, this one here for a second, <clears throat> this is the male type pattern. So there's more of a, a sharp angle, kind of parabolic. You know, you can also tell by where they shielded this person that that's, that's more the male type, hopefully. They're shielding them correctly. So that's just a side a side point, but can come in kind of handy for gamesmanship purposes. Um, <clears throat> so what about this one? So this one, you kind of notice that the hips are not that well covered, right? Like they're kind of sticking out. And so this is acetabular dysplasia or developmental dysplasia of the hip. And again, I won't drill down on this too much, but it brings up one other angle that we sometimes look at. I, I must say, I don't usually look at it too much, but it's this, this center edge angle. And it's in that paper. <clears throat> and basically what you do for that is you're trying to look at, if you have the center of the femoral head here and an angle between that and the acetabular rim, how big is that angle? So if I was going to actually do it on this case, I could go here and try to go to the center of the femoral head and then you'd have another line like this, 
Okay, so this is the center edge angle. And the normal for that is like above 22 degrees or something like that. And so you can imagine the, the further out the femoral head is, the bigger that angle, um, the, the, sorry, the smaller that angle gets. And so that's one way of looking at um, DDH. There's a number of other ways to kind of look at that as well. But basically, usually we're just qualitative about things and dis discuss things like you know, partial uncovering or moderate uncovering of the femoral head. Okay, so shallow acetabulae on both sides in this patient. And you may see views like this one. So this is a so-called false profile view. And basically, they're, they're getting this view as kind of like a Jude view, but it's a little steeper, actually. And you're seeing this left acetabulum here with the femoral head. You see the cartilage space, and you're getting a sense of how much coverage there is in an opposite projection. So you know, we can tell on the frontal view that it's shallow in a medial lateral direction. This gives you some sense of how shallow it is in an AP direction. And um, also can tell you if you see like degenerative change and cartilage space loss more posteriorly. So that's kind of the idea there. Because what you're trying to avoid is a situation like this, where, you know, we don't know for sure because this is an older patient, but but where they where they may well have had DDH and um, you know, just wasn't addressed, and they end up with severe arthropathy bilaterally, where the femoral heads are kind of riding up and you know, sh moving cephalad. There's complete loss of cartilage space, sclerosis, little fragmentation, and so on. So, like end stage arthropathy related to uh, DDH, probably. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at a couple other cases here in the last five minutes. I have a few. Uh, trauma cases and a little MR uh, correlation for a couple of them. So come into the left hip here. Let's take the, the normal one first. Um, it's tuned up here. So if you're if you're in the ED rotation or wherever, you know, looking for fractures, the I'd say the the you know critical things are to to try to follow bony continuity of, of the structures like for anything, but so for the, the hip, key thing to know is that fractures can be darn subtle, right? So you got to be really careful, and we can miss them. Follow the femoral head neck contour here medially and laterally, and you shouldn't see any, any signs of, like, cortical disruption. You can also follow the trabecular pattern. So you follow these medial trabeculae that come along here, kind of um, compressive, and then there's these other trabeculae that go here. They're called the, uh, the tensile trabeculae. Make sure those are kind of lining up. <clears throat> and if you have a true lateral view, um, you want to follow the same things there, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So that's normal, right? That, that we can easily take. This one is like comfort food level, kind of easy fracture to detect, right? You, if you don't see this one, you may be in the wrong field. Um, because there's, there's kind of an angular malalignment between the femoral head and neck and the lower part of the neck. So it's kind of mid femoral neck, cortical break medially. And like, like many fractures, you know, they're not just all separated in big lucent things. There could be lucency medially, and then because it's sort of impacted laterally, you're seeing like increasing density because things are jammed together or they're overlapping. This is a scenario where really being careful about these true lateral views is really helpful. And so in this patient, this is the right hip. And now you're only going to get this view because they're they're in pain, and they you know if they suspect a fracture, you don't want to you know put them in a frog leg position. But here I think you can see signs of the fracture because you see the femoral head, and you're kind of want to come down into the neck here, and it's like oh, there's a little at least some irregularity in there. Maybe there's some lucency there. The posterior part looks pretty good, but probably in this in this patient, this irregularity there, and this vague density there could be the impacted area that's enough to, you know, should make you augment your suspicion that that's a fracture or just, you know, further confirm that in fact what we see on the AP view is is an acute fracture. Okay, so that one's pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> what about this one? Okay, let's zoom in on the hip here. Let's say there was right hip pain. Okay. And, you know, ER is calling. You've got a stack of 175 outpatient follow-up films to do. 
What do you think? Pretty good, right? So, okay, uh, forgetting about all the FAI stuff. Femoral head neck contours look good. Looking good there. And down to the trochanters. It actually looks okay. You see, this is a male patient. See that inner surface there? You get the soft tissue clue there, too. Um, left side. So it's not really well rotated, right? So remember that first point about when you when you do these these pelvis views, you should have the toes pointing up. <clears throat> this right right side one is pretty well AP of the hip. The left is not so AP, so it's a little bit of a bad angle. Um, anyway, that's probably what's causing that. And you look at the true lateral, it looks pretty good. This is sort of I'm, I don't want to say it's a trick, but it's just to you know remember we got to look at everything. And and this this was a good example of. Um, sacral fracture, where <clears throat> you can see on the left side, these are these arcuate foraminae that you kind of want to look at, not because the fractures go through them, but because they're kind of a cortical handle, if you will, on where fractures are visible. So right there, see that little irregularity there? That's suspicious that there's a little cortical break there, maybe right along in here. And this patient shows a nice example of when you look at the um, this inlet view, right? Here's the baby heading down in the inlet there. Sorry, it's a guy, but you know what I mean. Um, that you, you, on this view, you're kind of getting a uh, tangential view of the anterior aspect of the sacrum. So here's the normal side. Here's the abnormal side with a little bit of buckling there. So, so that's just a nice example where we actually can see sacral fracture on the radiographs. As you know, a lot of times they're actually really difficult or impossible to see. Okay. Let's see this one. So what do we have here? Um, if I had to, if you had to bet which hip is normal, right or left? Or you can take the other choice, which hip is abnormal, right or left? So we look at the right side here. <clears throat> Pretty good head neck continuity. No angulation, no extra sclerosis, no, um, you know, <clears throat> no lucencies versus the opposite side. There's just a subtle angular change here on the left, right? So if you look, look at this one in some detail, this kind of comes down. It like overlaps a little bit. There's a little bit of sclerosis, maybe a little sclerosis here. Nothing coming off that side. Um, so how many of you voted that the left side was... Uh, abnormal side. Fifty percent of you good. No, more than that. Um, so that's, so that's, you know, do we know, is that hundred percent sure for fracture? Pro hard to know for sure. Um, if you look at the true lateral view in this patient, <clears throat> um, let me rotate this down. Um, you know, question is, does it help you or not? And I think it probably does help you. This is sort of subacute in this patient. It's a couple weeks after the original injury. The original images were very difficult to uh, detect a fracture. <clears throat> but if you look, here's good continuity posteriorly. Here's anteriorly. And here's like this bony irregularity there. So that's like too acute. So that that's good for a fracture. You don't see it going all the way across. But, um, but that's compatible with uh, femoral neck fracture. Okay. And a lot of times the clinical picture is pretty clear. They've got enough pain. They can't get up and walk and so on. And so we're, we're good with that, and they'll just pin them. Um, let me see. Okay, this one here. So this is the MR from that patient that I just showed. <clears throat> and so this is an older scan. This is a coronal T1-weighted MR. And if I zoom in here, See, the normal marrow fat is nice and white in here, and uh, low signal line here in that mid-femoral neck, that's, that's the fracture line, right? It was more impacted laterally than medially. And there's some low signal around there that's some of the bone edema that you get from the, from the fracture. So this helped uh, you know, confirm that there was a fracture there if there was any question at all. It also confirms that it's, in fact, it's going all the way across the femoral neck, and that makes it a surgical fracture or, I mean, theoretically it could heal if, if the patient wanted to be, you know, on crutches for six weeks or something like that. But typically these days these are getting pinned. All right. So um, <clears throat> I won't show the T2 weighted images on that. Let me just get to the next case here. And th this one and maybe one more will be like the last case. Okay. Next victim here from the ER, male patient, uh, trauma, hip pain. Right side's pretty normal. 
um, good continuity. You know, you can follow the uh, trabeculae and stuff in here. Uh, no lucencies and so on. Left side, also pretty good, right? Little ossicle there, pretty well corticated. Here's like trabeculae lining up, looks nice. Looks good there. Greater trochanter, not too bad, right? So this is the scenario where, you know, depending on the indication, maybe that, oh, there's a fracture there. We, we have to get, you know, could get a CT, which is a pretty good test for detecting fracture. Um, but MR is probably a little better test. It's just not easily available to us in the, you know, sort of logistically. But let's take a look at this, this uh, left hip, and then we'll come back to that x-ray in a second. So here's the uh, T1 weighted MR, the left hip. <clears throat> and um, you see a little patchiness in the marrow that's symmetric, but in the region of the greater trochanter, lots of low signal here, there. So there's definitely an abnormality of the greater troche there. And then the question is, is this a fracture that goes all the way across the femoral neck or not? Because if it does, it becomes surgical. If it just involves the femoral uh, greater trochanter, it's non-surgical. And this one is basically non-surgical because there, there is a streak of some edema that goes partway down the, the, the inner trochanteric region, but that's not really a fracture line. Um, it's probably just some edema that's tracking down there. So the main fracture is like this transverse part that goes across the greater trochanter and it's not displaced there. So, you know, it would depend on the orthopedist and so on if they if they decided that this might be worrisome enough to pin it or not, but, but a lot of these patients should be able to be treated um, non non-operatively. So if you go back, it's like, well, in retrospect, could we see that? Uh, maybe, right? Like, there's like very subtle lucency along the femoral, uh, sorry, along the greater trochanter right in here, but that would be a tough call to make. Um, the lateral view looks pretty good as well. So MR definitely plays a good role in uh, detecting and characterizing fractures that you suspect or ruling out occult fractures um, <clears throat> and so on. So here's um, this one. Um, the, the point of this one, this is similar to the one that I showed a minute ago where hopefully now, you know, after a few minutes you can see, oh, this right side looks pretty good. The left side, there's kind of an angle problem going on here, right? And and it's it's so it's pretty convincingly a fracture where there's some impaction and it's like what would be a little bit of a valgus malalignment, if you will, or impaction of the femoral head neck junction. And part of the reason I have this one in here is because it's a technical um, technical you know botch on the MR part. Uh, so here's the MR. T1 weighted scan, and so you can see the fracture here coming across the femoral neck with a lot of surrounding edema. It's all it's all turns out to be fine, but but the the main point I was going to make is that one of these um, this one. So here's here's this is okay. This is T2 with fat suppression, and so again the marrow fat's all suppressed. You see the edema in the neck and the fracture there. Um, it's this one here where. They didn't use fat suppression on it, you know, and it was a, a tech mistake or whatever, but so it didn't didn't change the case, but it's just to point out sometimes you'll get cases where people in the outside are still not using a lot of fat suppression and you can really walk by the edema associated with fractures if you don't have the fat suppression um, on your T2 weighted and protein density weighted sequences. So that that's the main point about that one. <clears throat> and Here's one, let me, I'll stop with this one. This is just about 8.30 here, but a companion case. So here's a patient that has a, um, this is one of these metal on metal prostheses on the right side. We're not going to worry about that right now, but that's that's what that is. On the left side, looks like a fracture, right, involving the greater trochanter here. And the question is, okay, does that go all the way across or not? Is this a surgical case or not? And it's also a little more complicated because this patient also has a little bit of an offset, you know, funny angle here between the head neck junction. And so is that acute? You know, this looks like it's acute here. Is that acute or non-acute? Good, good um, patient to get MR on. So if you look at this, this patient's scan, um, coronal T1s. <clears throat> now the T1s will often show things pretty well. The T2s are probably a little more sensitive, but here you get a... <coughs> Real nice view of the 
this low signal kind of irregular serpentine line intertrochanteric region from that acute fracture and it looks like it's going all the way across the the trochanter here is a pretty well defined fracture line right so that's that's one as different than more extensive than the last one I showed of the younger patient this is going all the way across. this is going to need to get surgical fixation because it's basically an intertroch fracture this also shows us that that little bit of an angular deformity in the head neck junction here was old because the normal marrow signal sitting in there so you have that <clears throat> there's the T1 here's the T2 with fat suppression there's like normal low signal in the femoral head neck and you see the acute uh, you know or subacute few days of low signal in the in the um intertroch region so <clears throat> that's um i think that's a good stopping point there i had one last case but i think i'll i won't um show that so that's like a little bit of um hip and pelvis anatomy and imaging and um i'll stop the recording there and we'll take any questions